so welcome everyone to my quick lightning talk. Um, for me, this story started in summer of 2019. It was a very different time and I had some ideas on how to potentially detect some malicious packages um, in public open source repositories. And to test this theory, I started to collecting some data uh, about past incidents, about prior research, and then eventually also uh, about countermeasures taken by the open source package repositories. Um, and so I ended up with this huge document and I thought it would be really a shame to let that go to waste. So I uh, decided to write a blog post about it that turned out to be way longer than expected and a really slow writer. So I only ended up covering the time frame between 2011, which is when I found the first incident and 2017, because otherwise it would get too long and release early and release often. If you're wondering who's talking, that's me. I'm Hauke Libas. Uh, I'm a software engineering manager at CSI Security Group. We do remote forensics, uh, phishing detection and takedown, and in general threat intelligence, mainly for financial institutions and larger companies. And I'm uh, also a volunteer lifeboat helm, and I do all of that here in beautiful Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, starting with some definitions, what is package dependency compromise? How do I get it? How do I avoid it? Um, basically, we all are relying on a lot of packages that we download from public uh, open source package repositories, like for example, MPN or PyPy or um, uh, Ruby gems, for example, for the Ruby ecosystem. And um, we're managing these dependencies through application or language package managers uh, that help us keep track, uh, keep them updated and um, yeah, uh, stuff like that. Uh, also installing them, of course. Um, but if you download a malicious package, you uh, might potentially be compromised through that. And uh, that is then a subset of the larger software supply chain compromise, um, which could also uh, be done through other means, for example, by uh, compromising a compiler or something, some other thing that we uh, use to, in the end, produce the products that we uh, develop. Uh, what I won't cover is stuff like uh, operating system or otherwise system package managers, like for example, uh, APT on Linux. Um, yeah, so it's only about uh, application package managers. Um, looking at the timeline, uh, starting from 2011 to 2017 with uh, color coded in, uh, in proof of concepts. There were actually a lot of proof of concepts or uh, incidents that we thought initially might be actually malicious attacks, but then later turned out to be proof of concepts by some researchers, um, some countermeasures and uh, lots of research and publications. And in the end, we actually um, see in 2017, the two first malicious uh, incidents that I could find. Um, starting with the first one here in 2011, that was uh, research by Benjamin Lee Smith. Um, he had this great series of talks called Hacking with Gems that he would uh, present at Ruby conferences. Um, he would most often write packages that as part of the setup, um, the setup hooks, send a little ping to uh, server control by him with, for example, the username and the host name of the machine. And because he would um, present this at conferences, he would also uh, print the names of packages that he would write that uh, actually did uh, show the schedule of the current conference. Um, and he would uh, print that on uh, business cards and distribute them and, and at tables at the conference. So people would install them because they're all Ruby enthusiasts, of course. And, um, and then he would collect their host names and stuff. And of course, later had a, a much more fun talk um, 
when uh, when he would present and could look the people into the eye and say, um, watch out what you actually install. Um, but because the the Ruby community is uh, very focused on Ruby on Rails, of course, like if you have if you write some uh, web application in Ruby, it's probably Ruby on Rails. So that actually also gives uh, the opportunity to uh, directly integrate in that framework and, for example, extract uh, post information that is sent by HTTP post, like, for example, logging information and uh, send that uh, or forward it also to a malicious server, just because that probably covers most Ruby web applications. Um, yeah. But uh, looking at actually the first countermeasure that was or one of the first countermeasures that I could find that was employed by the community, um, that was just the registration of the uh, the name uh, requestist on uh, on the Python package index by a developer who noticed oh I actually mistyped that um, thank God uh, nothing was was downloaded here or executed and then. Uh, he just registered this name and I checked in uh, January of 2020 and it was still downloaded 1,200 times uh, just in that month and still four uh, repositories on GitHub are listing it as a dependency even though when you install it it just warns you that you shouldn't do this and uh, points you to the actual library. Uh, going further to the pizza party that was the first proof of concept of a warm or of a package that would spread itself. Um, that happened in uh, 2015 and was a POC by Chris Contolini. Um, he just published it on GitHub and didn't actually um, publish the package to NPM because that might be too risky. But what this was, would do is uh, it would check if the current user is also the developer or has publishing rights to another NPM package. And uh, it would then uh, first open a kind of annoying YouTube video in the, in the foreground and in the background um, create uh, minor versions of the packages that the victim had uh, publishing access to and it would then publish these minor versions minor versions because then many people might uh, upgrade automatically and um, it, this these new versions would then include exactly the same spreading code uh, also in their setup hooks and yeah so the circle would continue um, another incident that i put in here that isn't directly related to uh, security, but maybe you already uh, saw there the infamous left pad incident on NPM. Um, for reasons that we won't go into, a developer decided to delete uh, 273 packages that he developed and maintained. Um, and that impacted a lot of very popular packages either directly or indirectly through other dependencies that they had that then in turn depended on left pad, which was just a single line, um, a single line dependency. Um, thankfully, and here we also see how the community works together. This package name was uh, re-registered by a good actor within 10 minutes because they noticed that the, uh, their uh, continuous integration processes would fail. And I mean, they failed over the, all over the world. Um, so they re-registered that so that nobody malicious could uh, take that one over and uh, full functionality was restored within two and a half hours. Um, and I included this because it shows also how fragile these ecosystems can be. And um, yeah, that was in March of 2016. Going further, also, um, these are actually incidents that I want to go into a bit more detail on because I have my own theories about them. Um, this was Fate Zero, uh, a security researcher from China. And he noticed when uh, he tried to just uh, execute some Python code 
that it failed with uh, this warning. Import error, no module named smb.smb connection. You just wanted to uh, create a Samba connection um, and then noticed, oh, this SMB thing doesn't seem to be a standard library. I have to install it. So uh, what is the first thing you do? Uh, pip install SMB, maybe. But it turns out that that actually isn't the name of the package that was wanted on, uh, on the Python package index. But that was called py SMB instead of SMB. So the takeaway here is that the name of the package on a package manager doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the name of the modules that that uh, package then exports. Um, yes, so after he noticed that, he started uploading uh, 23 typo squatting packages of the same type. So packages that either imitated uh, other packages that might be expected to be there, um, like SMB or proxy and stuff like that. And he generated uh, more than 2,000 downloads of many of these uh, within 24 hours. In the setup hook of these packages, he, uh, he uh, put some code that would send the username, hostname, IP, of course, some other information actually to a public GitHub repository and would create issues there for each of these uh, like infected victims, uh, which of course isn't great from a privacy perspective. And uh, after some discussion, he also deleted these, uh, these packages again and then wrote a really nice uh, blog post about it that unfortunately is in uh, Mandarin. Um, but uh, it's, it really goes into depth on a lot of these things and uh, also shows other options that a user could have to be confused about something and how you could uh, exploit that. And the interesting thing is that one and a half months later, uh, we had the cross end in incident on NPM, which uh, is on a different platform. It's no longer uh, PyPy, but NPM. But it had some striking similarities uh, to the uh, to the research proof of concepts that uh, Fate Zero uh, made that uh, led me to believe that this one was probably heavily inspired by that blog post. Um, some of the uh, similarities are, for example, if you take a look at the names that Fate Zero used there on the left side and the typo squatting names that these malicious actors used. Um, you see there's a lot of overlap and especially uh, TK Inter is a weird, um, a weird package to impersonate on NPM because that is very much a, a Python library to um, to uh, interface with uh, the toolkit GUI uh, library. So it doesn't really make any sense to, uh, to try to impersonate that on NPM. And yeah, that is just uh, one more thing that leads me to believe that that is heavily inspired. Um, the, this cross end incident was then discovered by a Twitter user or um, a person who then informed the author of the actual cross env library, which is uh, named cross-env uh, on NPM. And yeah, he informed him. And uh, then quickly the uh, malicious packages were taken down. These packages were actually malicious because they would send the environment variables to, um, to a server that is also connected with um, like Chinese cybercrime. Um, and of course, in the environment variables, there might be tokens or other secrets um, that should uh, not see the, the light of day. Um, yeah, so that was the first actually malicious incident that I could find. And um, here, of course, we need collaboration between, uh, between languages or between repositories, between the borders to, uh, to fight this. Um, 
some short summary. Uh, the vectors that I saw for package imitation is mainly typo squatting. Um, so yeah, writing something slightly wrong, but also a lot of standard library squatting. Sometimes you can register the um, standard libraries that uh, are part of a language. You can also register them on the open source package repositories, or you at least could in the past. I think that's fixed everywhere now. Um, then package takeovers, which uh, would be, for example, because a developer is compromised or a token is published somewhere. Um, there, of course, multi-factor authentication helps, but it's not perfect, as we see in, in the financial industry, too. Um, and then, of course, scanning for publicized tokens, but also simple stuff like always sending an email notification if you or if a package that you are the owner of um, gets a new version. In most cases, you might just be annoyed and be like, yeah, I, I know that I just uh, published a new version. But when you get that email and you didn't uh, publish a new version, then you know that something is wrong. Yeah, then we have the vectors of re-registration of a popular package name after it was deleted by its owner. Um, can fix that with cooldown uh, timers and stuff like that, or manual review. Um, but also simple, simply taking over maintainership by a package by just offering that. And that is something that didn't fit on my timeline because it's after 2017, but it happened that a bad actor just went to uh, an open source maintainer. These are stressed people. <laughs> it's a pretty thankless job sometimes. So if somebody offers help, they uh, gladly accept that, maybe if they can show some nice PRs. And um, yeah, that of course is hard to defend against. Um, they are the only thing that helps is really to share indicators of compromise and uh, identify the infrastructure used by bad actors so that they cannot at least reuse that and make their life a bit harder. Uh, in summary, attacks are happening. Uh, collaboration across language boundaries is needed. Why, the, why aren't there more attacks, I ask myself. That might be a very developer-centric question because for me it's, it's very obvious to how to exploit that and stuff like that. But for advanced actors, it might be too much publicity um, because it's uh, you, you have the audit trail. Basically, as soon as you're discovered, everyone can see what you did. And for other, maybe a bit less advanced actors, there's still other methods that still work like phishing or, or um, maybe buying a browser plugin, stuff like that. Um, that still might be easier than, than this. Um, in the end, I would uh, close with a quote from Sam Boyer from his post, so you want to write a package manager, and that is uh, package management is at, is at least as much about people, what they know, what they do, and what they can reasonably be responsible for, as it is about source code and other things a computer can figure out. And that is also very true for the security aspect of it. So thanks for tuning in. And I'll be in the chat room for questions.